former uh, chairman of NBC Universal Television. Now, uh, I guess I'm president, vice president, um, PA, whatever, for, of my own company, Gaspin Media. And I'm here with uh, Ted Sarandos, uh, who is chief content officer for Netflix. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Uh, Ted and I know each other for uh, about 10 years now, and Ted, you started at, Tef, uh, at Netflix about 10 years ago, right? 11 years ago? 11 years ago, yeah. yeah what do you think are the biggest differences between when you started and Netflix today? Well, the big one has been the migration from DVD through the mail to streaming, and it's, right. the interesting one, though, has been that that's what we had set out to do way back when I first met Reed, you know, almost 12 years ago, uh, which was that we were going to be a digital distribution company, and we were going to build the subscription base and the delivery model and everything else through DVD through the mail. Right. Uh, with our eyes on digital, at the time we thought of, of it as a downloading business, uh, but then it was the kind of click and watch uh, nature of streaming. That was the light bulb moment when, you know, that we moved, when we moved into streaming. And both from the consumer behavior and the digital delivery cost and everything just kind of came together a little over five years ago when we started streaming. So five years ago is the real inflection point? Yeah, definitely. All right. So in, in the most recent report I saw um, for the fourth quarter, um, you had about 2 billion streams. 2 billion hours of streaming. 2 billion stream. hours of streaming, yeah. which made you, someone did the calculation, not me, but it made you the 15th largest cable network, but in Netflix homes, like the second largest cable network. Yeah, I saw that analysis. Yeah. And do you, do, you, do you expect at some point Netflix will be number one? You know, it's, it's an interesting way we kind of measure ourselves, which is do we get people, can we grow engagement? you know, the, the hours of, that you spend in a given right. month on you watching Netflix. And it's an interesting thing because there's uh, increasingly most of the viewing is done on television. So it means somebody is making a choice which remote to pick up, which buttons to push to put Netflix on that television screen instead of something else. And the customer who spends a lot of time with us um, stays around for a long time and tells their friends about it and discovers new shows and all those things. And the customer who's super casual uh, tends not to. So we really try to focus on uh, increasing the engagement. So if we do our job right, you know, we'll definitely move up on, so, on that So way. what are some of your techniques for increasing engagement? You know, we're, we're all used to more traditional media and how we get viewers to come, come more often. What, what do you have to do, you know, when you're primarily a streaming service? So um, there's been a couple of changes in the business. Our, uh, when we were DVD through the mail only, uh, TV programming was, you know, 15, 18% of viewing, TV on DVD. Uh, on streaming, it's more than 60%, or right. nearly 60% of, of viewing is television programming. And more interestingly, though, it's the uh, kind of one-hour serialized dramas that people really discover, fall in love with, and get really addicted to. I mean, I, the stories I hear about people who spend their you know, entire holiday weekend right. a few weeks ago watching uh, Breaking Bad, you know, like the yeah. entire three years um, of Breaking Bad in a, in a weekend. I, someone termed it binging. Yeah, which yeah. Uh, which I actually we're like. trying to I find mean, a better word for it, but <laughs> binging. But I, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. You know, we, cable is always marathon content. We right. always got viewers and cable to watch more often by marathoning. But I never heard the term binging before, and that's really almost what it is. And what I found really interesting is my 19-year-old son is the one who first you know sort of un made me understand the consumer behavior. Right. But the other day I was talking to my 75-year-old mother. And she told me she spent the whole weekend watching, um, uh, I think, Homeland yeah. on her VOD. And, and, and that's when, when you have a behavior that 19-year-olds do and 75-year-olds yeah. do, you know you're, you're seeing something that's a, a longer-term trend, not something that's just you know, the next generation. Yeah, and I think where, where we kind of differentiate ourselves in that, in that space is the personalization. So being able to find incredible things that you just missed. You know, the, these uh, new, fresh shows are incredibly popular and incredibly valuable, of course. But like when, like last night, you know, most people watch the first episode of Mad Men. Right. So that's what's really exciting to us is that, you know, that you could bring new people to a show. In, in this case, that's, you know, been off the, air, off the air waiting for its new season. Or in other cases where it's a show that literally may have been a one season and out show that otherwise would have disappeared from the culture. So like uh, the Fox series Terriers is doing very well, really well on Netflix. And it's just the personalization. It's not me or some team of editors trying to put that in front of people, but it's just the developing the algorithms that helps people discover great stuff. And, and it's even better. You know, it takes almost the same effort to get someone to discover a 90-minute movie as it does, you know, 126 hours of, right. of, of Lost. So. Your measurement is quite different, though, than the measurement that, that many television executives are used to. So how, how do you measure success and how does that compare to success that you might see on a traditional broadcast or a cable network? 
I think it's um, maybe one of the more interesting mistakes that premium TV made was publishing ratings. Because I think ratings is a one-dimensional uh, one dimensional success. So if a, show, if a lot of people watch a show, but they, don't, but they cancel the, the, the service the day after the show's over, I don't know how successful that show was. You know? So I think that when you, um, when you look at it and say, did this show get good ratings relative to the cost of producing it or acquiring it? Uh, did, does, does it uh, generate publicity and for the brand and put the brand out in the kind of into the public discussion? Um, and does it create kind of a brand halo on the rest of the content? So I think that sometimes you could do that with a very low rated show and it's just a matter of figuring out what the economics are. So. All right, let's, um, let's, let's go back six months. Netflix is unstoppable, a seemingly unstoppable. And then two perceived blunders, real blunders, I won't make a judgment. Um, Quickster and the price increase happen sort of one after the other. Yeah. What happened? So um, we made decisions that I believe were 100% consistent with the streaming video company, which was to create distance between the streaming video company and the DVD by mail business. And the, what I say that was 100% consistent, which is the, the more we grew, the more we grow the streaming business, the more international the service is, uh, the more that the, uh, that the DVD by mail in the U.S. is an anomaly. So the effects the, of the, the technologies that you have to support it only work in the United States. Right. When you talk about the brand, um, you know, when people hear that Netflix is coming to the U.K., a big chunk of people know that Netflix is a DVD company still. So the more distance we can create from the two service, you know, from DVD through the mail for a streaming company, we thought the better. I would say that it is um, uh, our weakness and our strength is that we're willing to do big things quickly, you know, tear the band-aid off and jump in. And I think in this case, it was insensitive uh, relative to consumer expectation uh, to, to, surprise, to surprise our subscribers and our members uh, with change. They don't, no one really wants change, right. particularly it's a brand that people really love. And what's great and, and, uh, and challenging about the internet is when people, they take ownership of the brand. They feel like it's their brand too. And it, and it is their brand too. And we moved too, way too quickly you know, for that. And, and, and then you, you, you see the kind of power of the internet how to mobilize a public opinion. And it turned very quickly and the, and for that change. So, so. so would you say that, that the, the consumer, the, inter, the, you know, the, 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 I guess this is kind of the first time that, that I think I, I, rec, I, I saw s so quickly consumer behavior changing what, what might be your business plan, your, your, your business model. Or certainly the timing of it, right. for sure. So yeah. you, you think it's just you've got to figure out a way to get it done in a, in a, in a different way, slower, with, yeah. with, more, uh, with more of a telegraph to the, to the, uh, the consumer. Yeah, the communication has got to be very clear, it has to be very, uh, the, the, what it's going to be, people don't want to have to wonder what it's going to be like, because in a vacuum I think people will imagine something horrible. Right. And in fact, I think there was nothing really that wrong with the plan. It's just that eventually the public opinion just turned on us so heavily that it was like, well, this is not worth trying to resell this. Yeah. So does that mean you can't make another change right now or you've got to delay any changes you might make that might be perceived as big, you know, anti-consumer? No, or no we, just, we just have got to make sure that the consumer has a very loud voice in the decision right. and in the process. And always. I assume you, you and we talk always a lot, do, by the right. way. I assume so. you talk a lot to your consumer now. What are you hearing? What are they... Have they passed it? Have they forgiven you? Well, you know, who knows? But I'd say that, you know, for the, um, you know, we've announced that we've kind of gotten through the point where people were bailing on the service over the changes and right. we kind of returned to, to, to growth. And so, but, but it's one of those things that sticks with the brand that we just have got to, you know, keep reinforcing with, with our customers that we, heard, we saw what, we, you know, we know what we did and we're being more mindful of it on, in every other thing that we do, you know, in site enhancements, in content negotiations, in everything that we do. Do you think it's more perceived than real, or do you think it's a... Yeah, well, I mean, in the impact perceived than real? No, I think what's, re what's real is, is that there were, um, you know, price changes are, are delicate, right. um, service changes are delicate, and I think that, you know, the notion of two separate websites was, a, you know, something where that people, that, it freaked people out. And so I think in, in the way that um, measurably some people left the service because they didn't like the idea right. of change, and then some people left the service because they didn't like the idea, even if it didn't impact them. So there's a bunch of things around that, and then we, you know, so you have to get through that and right. kind of start over and rebuild the brand and rebuild the trust. So, and then we think, you know, in those cases where it mostly applies to the DVD by mail business, you know, that business is going to be evolving uh, very rapidly uh, with, with or, no matter what we do. So there was a, uh, a grand vision that we would do, make that change, 
to kind of prop up the DVD right. business and stay more focused on the DVD business. But the truth is, the DVD business is going to see you know, declines no matter what we do. Right. So let's talk about that for one second, because Warner Brothers just announced they're going to extend the delay for DVD for yeah. Netflix from 26 days to 52 or something like yeah. that. They doubled it. I assume that will precipitate an even faster decline if you can, you know, if other studios climb on board and... Yeah, I think what it does is it creates an uncertainty about the business that consumers are not comfortable with. If you, if you remember back to the launch of Blu-ray and HD DVD, um, when you're trying to cons explain right. the difference to consumers, the first thing they do is stop buying. And I, I think when you start getting into, um, you know, confusion as to when things are going to be available on what windows, is that going to be for rental, is that going to be, I think the, the confusion will be a net negative, I think, to, for consumers, which ultimately may be a net negative for the disc business too. Okay. Let's talk about your original strategy, because that's something that's, uh, that's somewhat new. You have your first original show launching next month, right? Yeah, February, 6th, February 6th. So just to give us a little story on, your, on your, um, your original strategy, how you picked Lily Hammer as the first one. Okay. You know, you have a big bet on House of Cards, right? Yeah, House of Cards. So the, um, the origin of the strategy itself was, you know, our business, our streaming business is, was launched primarily non-exclusive in terms of the content. Um, that the brand was, uh, the company and the kind of consumer proposition was so broadly differentiated that exclusive content really wasn't going to be part of the differentiation. Um, over time, you know, we think that certainly over the next few years that uh, people will try to call out the benefits of our business. You're seeing it today with HBO Go and uh, Showtime's, uh, you know, uh, TV Everywhere right. models, all these different models. So that, in, that increasingly, that, you know, exclusive content may be uh, an, an increasingly important differentiator. Um, so that was one motivation. The other motivation was uh, the thing I said earlier about the one-hour serialized drama. People just, I mean, it's a very addictive right. uh, you know, uh, piece of product that brings people incredible joy. And it's also very economically challenged on network and cable television. So um, producing a, you know, the one-hour serialized drama with this very expensive writing and everything that goes into these shows, um, and they're also very difficult to syndicate because they are too serialized. We saw some problems like with you know, Play Playboy Club and yep. uh, where, where they had to kind of deserialize the show from its original roots to try to get it to, to work better. Um, and then the DVD box set, which used to really drive the economics of a lot of these shows, as you know, uh, which is also go, you know, drying up a bit. So when you look at that and say, well, you know, broadcasters and cable operators are probably not going to be going as deep into the serialized game as we would like, so we'd have a healthy kind of season after content model the way we're in. And so it's a one way is to say if we need to develop that muscle because only HBO, Showtime, and Stars are going to be producing those shows and, and, they, won't, and they don't want to sell to us, then maybe that's a, develop, a muscle we should develop on our own. So what, so what do you think the business model for original content premiering on Netflix is? Because if it, you know, HBO or Showtime or any of the broadcasters or cable networks now have you as the secondary window. Right. What's the secondary window for a Netflix original and how, or do you have to pay for both? Uh, well, we'll find out. Right now, um, the, um, the, the HBO, Showtime, and Stars, they don't necessarily want to sell their stuff in the season after window. Right. In a perfect world, we would do nothing but license their stuff in a season after or two season after model. I think it's a much better use of our cash and a much bigger benefit to, the, to, the, to those guys to make their content more efficient. Right. Um, but, they, you know, they, they have a, a different strategy. They want to go exclusive, and that's fine. So uh, if there's a, right now in our first wave of content, we don't own the shows. So we're doing it in conjunction with the production companies that retain different sets of rights. So, um, but can sell in syndication, kind of in the, in the traditional models, um, and certainly on DVD and all the other ways. So that, you, I mean, we have no idea because it never happened before. But right. do you think a show that premieres and gets its, all its attention drawn through Netflix will have a secondary window? Because you know, we know there was secondary windows for broadcast yeah. very successful. Cable was difficult till actually till Netflix came along. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of secondary, not a lot of syndication success for cable right. series, scripted, um, not a lot of places to go, and, and you know, even DVD sales were limited. Yeah, I think in, in previous years you'd say that there weren't any cable-to-cable -cable sales of right. net, and, we've got, and now we're starting it's to starting see to some. Happen. So I think it'll, it'll move along that same kind of trajectory. So how much original content do you guys think you'll have, and do you have, well, is we, it just uh, experimentation right now, or do you really think? It's bigger than experimentation, but it's definitely right. learning. Right. So we don't think that we're going to necessarily get it right right off the bat. You know, I, I look at HBO didn't have a, a, a hit show really right. for eight years when they first got in. Uh, it took them that long to figure out the wire, and then it's, then and they kind of I think they kind of stumble on you know the highly serialized you know cliffhanger shows too. Uh, but we're also going to distinguish ourselves differently. Like in, in the case of Lilyhammer, we're going to launch the entire season on right. one day. 
So you can, if you are that person that wants to watch the whole show over a weekend, you can do it. Uh, and it also enables you to discover it way down the road. Um, uh, the, the show itself, just to set expectations, it's, not, it's, a, it's a bit small. It's a, it's a quirky, very interesting show, but it's you know, partially subtitled. It's shot in Norway. We did it in conjunction with Norwegian television. Right. So the, you know, the Norwegian cast is speaking some English and Norwegian, and the Stevie the star is speaking English, so it's partially subtitled in that way. Uh, but it's a very good show that works for its, for its core audience. Um, what's coming down the road, as you mentioned, House of Cards as well, will um, we'll deliver uh, late, late 12 or early 13. Um, this is David Fincher uh, directing the pilot and, uh, and a phenom phenomenal cast. You know, Kevin, Kevin Spacey's in his first television project, right. Robin Penn Wright starring in it, uh, uh, Bo Willimon, who's uh, wrote, is, is the head writer of the show and one of the producers of the show, and he just nominated for an Oscar today for, for Ides of March. And, so, um, so that, that show will be coming. We've got uh, Arrested Development is out yep, there that we'll... Fantastic. We're yeah, thrilled that you're doing that. Thank you. So it's, it'll have the, an original and exclusive fourth season of Arrested Development, which will be coming uh, roughly the same time, early 13. Uh, and then we have two other fair, pretty ambitious shows that are still kind of, that are in the work. So by mid-13, we should have five uh, very high-profile shows, uh, original shows on Netflix. And do you expect to launch them all the same way you're launching Lily Hammer, which is all at once, or you'll wait and see? We're going to test it a little bit. We're going right. to use it to, to figure out what, you know, what's the best way to right. engage with the consumers on it. So I, I would think maybe different flavors, always multiple. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see us doing a, a every week episode. Right. I would strategy. think, though, that the if you did it every week or, or more often than once, right. you bring the consumer back to Netflix week after week, and then maybe they sample... Yeah. More product, and you just get that that engaged consumer that you talked about earlier. Yeah, we gotta, what you have to figure out is is you know is it the thing that the, is it is it um, more frustrating than it's right. exciting, and then finding the right balance between that. Like I, I find the new fall season to be incredibly frustrating if I love a new show, because I don't want to wait till next week to right. watch the next one. Oh, but twice a week, or just yeah. more often, or two yeah. at a time. But stretching it out yeah. to it, it's just it, it'll be. I, I think we'll all be very interested to see yeah. how that plays out because it's. You know, it, it certainly matches what we talked about earlier, the binging yeah. uh, consumer behavior that we're seeing. Well, we had, a, we had a great discussion with the talent, you know, with, with Lilyhammer. They were not, you know, Stevie Van Zandt was like, well, you know, we wrote this, you know, we wrote the show for six right. months, right. and then we shoot the thing for a year, and then you're going to put it all up, and, and he's like, and you're just going to be up in one day, and then it's all out there? It's go, like yeah. holiday dinner. You cook it all day long, and you <laughs> it's in over. ten minutes. And well, then, I, but I told him, I go, that's exactly how, you, you know, he, he's, in the, he's in the E Street band. Right. I go, that's exactly how you re release yeah. an album. I go, in some cases, you spend your whole life writing that album. And then you put it all out right. and, let, and let the consumer take it. So I think if people want to watch it one a week, they can. If you want to watch it all in one weekend, you can. I right. think that, that it's core to, to the Netflix proposition with our customers yep. is, is choice. So I think more choice is better. And by putting it out in, in, higher, in, in bulk in that way, I yeah, think we get the choice. It's so counter to what, you know, what traditional media executives have done for all yeah. these years. So I think we're going to be very interested to well, see how is, it plays out. You know, that's been interesting to every show that we've added uh, when we add full season. Um, we go, we are at the complete inverse of the networks. Right. So in the networks, even if a show is pretty successful, every week they lose viewers and the audience is smaller every week throughout. And with Netflix, every week the, opposite, the audience for a single, any given show grows. So by the end, of, by, you know, after we've had it for a month, it's actually we have more people into the show and they're coming in through the first right. episode. Do, do, you have any, do you have any evidence yet whether viewers that come and watch a series on Netflix that's still in production on a network? Yeah. That, they, that the network sees some, some lift yeah. from that? So there's no, I mean, some of it's anecdotal, right? right. I think that, um, I, I think in every case for an on-air show, Netflix has been net positive for the broadcast network that's airing the show or the cable channel that's airing the show. Um, the few of them that people you know, would attribute would be like Sons of Anarchy right. that had a very successful third season launch uh, after the first two were very successful on Netflix. Uh, Walking Dead, I think, is one that will had you know had built a great audience right. you know from from the first season where you know people discovered that show kind of slowly, and I think it's really really beneficial for a, a, the more serialized the show is, the more likely it's going to be beneficial. M Mad Men is an example where I would say that far more people have seen the first uh, episodes of Mad Men on Netflix than ever right. saw them on AMC, which has built a great audience you know and all so this. So it'll be interesting to see season. when when the next season of Mad Men comes out. Yeah. If they see a big lift from... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. All right. Um, so let's talk about Netflix's relationship with Hollywood. A few years ago, Hollywood didn't know whether to fear Netflix, whether to, you know, thank Netflix. 
Where, where do you stand now? What do you think, this, what do you think the relationship is now? I, I think it's, it's just normalized. We're, we're a buyer. We're a, real, we're a big buyer. You're one of the biggest buyers here, if not I, the biggest buyer. At I, Matthew, imagine, right? we're, I imagine we are. And I think it's in, in that way that we get kind of integrated into the strategy. And uh, even in our original production you know, business, um, you know, Fox is producing Arrested right. Development, so we're just a customer in that space. So there's a bunch of conflict always because most of the studios own distribution and content, uh, which causes a bunch of conflict in decision making. And no one knew exactly were we good for one, good for one team and bad for the other, or, or vice versa. And really, what we have to do is say, well, you really don't have to figure that out because we are net positive to the economics of your programming. Right. And, if, and 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 if it all works well, we're net positive to your broadcast networks too. So so now Hollywood looks at you a little bit like the golden goose. Do you worry that they're going to just, you know, when they need to hit certain quarterly numbers, that they're just going to use Netflix as an opportunity to try to push pricing and bring more money in the tent? And, and how, do you, how does that affect your model, and what do you do about that? Generally, positively, because of access. So, you know, if there's quarterly pressure from suppliers, it has been, uh, the net result has been, um, you know, some new nuance right. to access. So it's not that I, you know, the, the notion of we want to protect this, we want to protect that, you know, so a lot of that's great in theory. But at the end of the day, you produce content to, right. to monetize it, and we're a way to monetize it. So typically, it's been net positive to us more than it's been. You know, we're going to jam Netflix with the X, Y, and Z. We have uh, you know long-term deals with the pretty defined puts, and the way that the shows flow to us is, are fairly predictable. So, t so tell us a little bit about what happened with the with the Stars deal, right? Yeah. There was a lot of talk before Stars renewal and how yeah. they were going to gouge you, and they were going to really yeah. you know that, this is the press reporting, not me <laughs> saying that, but. Um, and then you didn't make the deal. So yeah. what happened? Well, we were, we were at the table for a long time. And we would have liked to have re renewed that deal with Stars, And I think they would have liked to have renewed it with us. Um, but that's one of those c conflicts that we just talked about, of whether the revenue from Netflix was going to be net positive in light of the fact that they would create conflict with their carriage agreements. And therefore, the economics of the deal had to be so big that they would have to uh, compensate for things that we had no benefit from. So we already had kind of warped incentives and you know, baked into the deal. I think what's interesting about it is we, you know, we, everyone always contemplated that that deal was going to come up for renewal. We would have to have it. We would pay anything for it, and it would crush our margins. So you know, renewing, that, re, you know, renewing stars was, it was, it was critical. And then when it, when it came down to it, you know, it, it's a very tip, I think it's very typical of a programming decision, which is if you have a really expensive show or a really expensive group of shows to license, to produce or license, and relative to that fee, no one's watching them. I don't mean nobody. I mean the, the ratings are not high enough relative to that fee. Then, then the shows get canceled, and that's a very business as usual story for almost everyone in this room. And that's really what happened. Right. You know, it was single digit viewing, and the the the, you know, the requirement to renew the deal would have been you know way disproportionate, which means it would have created a, an immense opportunity cost, and a, it would have been hugely negative for our subscribers because all that you know premium dollars that would have been poured into that relative to viewing right. would have mean we couldn't close other deals that people were watching in much greater numbers. Right. So right on the heels of that deal, you know, we closed this exclusive deals with AMC and the CW for content that is being watched in much bigger numbers than, yeah. that, than Stars is currently. And, you know, and so really when you look at it and say, how do you describe what happens when the Stars content? And it's just you know, really the, we, the Sony content went away almost a year ago. And so it was down to basically the Disney output and a bunch of catalog movies. And it's all good stuff. We'd love, love to have it, no question. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, is, is how much can you pay for yeah. just you know, what is single-digit viewing like that? Yeah. All right. Let's talk, some, let's talk a few general questions, and then we'll open it for some questions to the Great. audience. Um, in five years or in 10 years, are people going to watch linear television? That's a great question. I, you know, I think it's a generational thing. And I think what's really been amazing, in the, first, in the uh, fourth quarter, we streamed 2 billion hours of content. And in that time period, linear TV viewing actually went up a little bit. Um, you know, people, right. are not, can't, people aren't turning off the TV and only watching. So it's, it's incredible, I think, how expansive the entertainment universe can be you know, if you really do it in a way that consumers can you know, develop a relationship with content and, the, and their delivery you know, suppliers and all those things. So when I look at that and say, well, people are going to just turn things off, I think what will happen is TV will be far more live event centric not you know Super Bowl, right. the Oscars, but also you know American Idol and X Factor and America's Got Talent, and that's happening all over the world. I mean, the, the most popular shows are these kind of results-oriented competition shows, and, and that's very uniquely you know in, in, in linear television's wheelhouse because that there's where you have to you know the whole right. country. Once you know who won, you know you don't want to go to work and have somebody tell you. 
So maybe I think that's what's propping right. up linear television now. And, and those shows seem to be getting more exciting and drawing bigger audiences all the time. So I, I, don't, I think that will keep people yeah. tuned into linear television. So, you know, what, what happens to advertising? And, and is it, you know, does it become more subscription-based? Um, you know, you just, you just really start seeing, I'd say, five to ten years from now, yeah. viewing habits just changing drastically. Yeah. Well, the subscription should be an alternative monetization model right. to advertising. And so I think what's interesting, you know, I think when anytime anyone watches anything, they subconsciously, you know, make, make trade-offs. So, you know, I, I give the example a lot about Avatar, you know, where going to see Avatar in 3D, you know, on IMAX 3D, is, it was a radically different experience for people. And some people got in the car and drove really far, and they right. passed their local theater because they wanted to see it in IMAX and in 3D, and, and paid a premium for the ticket. And for everyone who did that, you know, thousands of people are going to wait and watch it on TNT with commercials, you know, three years from now, three years later. So people are making all those trade-offs around how urgent it is that I must see it, how much do I care about the quality of the presentation. Right. So I think that in, in all of these models that, you know, there are trade-offs which keeps this kind of the studios and networks are able to kind of skim the market in that way. And consumers do it voluntarily. You know, you can, you can opt into it or opt out of it. And the subscription window right now is a way that they can, you know, the studios and networks, and we can figure out what is the kind of right window for that, for that product. And the more that it generates, the kind of the moves up the pecking, you know, up in the pecking order. Right. So I think there's always this great place for advertising supported content. Um, there's another thing that I kind of, my theory around it too is that, you know, ad, ad CPMs are more based on scarcity than anything else. And, you know, there's only one Super Bowl, and that's right. why they get right. those, all these great ad rates. And I think that's going to be the challenge of ad-supported content online is this perception of unlimited inventory. Right. So. All right. Well, we've got about four or five minutes left. If you've got a few questions, there's a mic. If you could just stand by the mic, that would be great. Is there, can, is there a way to get the mic turned on? We're going to select your, com your question out. By the way. You don't have to turn it on. Somewhere. Well, if you talk loud, we'll repeat it. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Give him a third microphone. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's running about 60, 40 TV, TV versus movies. So, and, and the trend is actually rising for television. Would anyone else like to shout out a question? Get the OBA from the diaphragm, please. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't I think the question was just about a change in acquisition strategy, less indie and more traditional, right? I, I would say that's a, a radical misperception. Uh, that there is the, the interesting thing, and what we're able to do is um, why, on some things, the people say, "Oh, Netflix paid a lot relative to the market," or people, Netflix got that cheap relative to the market. And the interesting thing for us is, in our acquisition strategy, is we can pay an enormous amount for a show that gets or a movie that gets watched an enormous amount of time. Right, so I think that we're, it's a very, we're able to bring kind of equilibrium to the, to the acquisition process, which is, doesn't really exist for, the, for anywhere else, which is to say, you know, we'll pay a lot for that because people are going to watch it a lot, not because it has a lot of buzz or because it won a lot of awards, just because people are going to watch a lot of it. And in the, same, in the same case is that we can get further and further down the tail. Now, the DVD business enabled us to be kind of, you know, everything published business, um, because it's a perpetual license and, you know, it didn't matter. It, you basically, I buy a disc and I can rent it till it breaks. Um, but in, in the case of, where you're constantly renewing licenses, you're renewing it um, based on what you know or what you can forecast the viewing hours to be. Now, sometimes you get the law of small numbers, you get down to a number that you and I won't agree on what the viewing is worth. And therefore, we don't probably close that deal. But I'd say that in terms of long tail, um, the things that are being watched on Netflix in enormous, in very high numbers would be things that pe today people characterize as very, very long tail. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Go ahead. I know you've been 
know at one point there were, there were plans to launch in several international territories that were kind of put on ice so you could focus on the UK and Latin America. Where are you from? <laughs> um, uh, I'm on the free trial at the moment. Great. Well, I should mention, thank you for the question. Uh, the question is when will we revisit uh, further expansion beyond our just announced, our just launched UK and Ireland. Um, that uh, a year ago when we were here at, at NATB, we had just been in Canada for a few months and uh, we had not yet launched, launched in Latin America. So we've had a lot of international change in a year. Um, and, then, and, um, and, and the only way, by the way, we're, it's possible to have had that kind of expansion in such a short amount of time um, has been, uh, you know, A, some efficient things like NATP, but also I have a, a phenomenal team of people, a lot of them are in this room, um, who you, a lot of you folks in this room do business with, Cindy Holland, who does our domestic, uh, our domestic television, uh, Jason, Sean, Kelly Merriman, who did all the deals for UK and, and, the, and uh, Ireland. So it's been able to, um, you can only do that if you have a really, I, I think, a really incredible team of people that you can just let loose in a territory and, and, and learn the territory and run. Um, the question about when, when we'll keep going is um, mostly what we've, we said is we're going to, we're investing very heavily in these new territories. And what we, what we have promised is that we want to return the business to, to global profitability before we expand any further. So it's, you know, we've got some r really large bets in Latin America and the UK and Ireland that we're only a couple weeks into in that case. So as, they, as those territories are, are, uh, are turning profitable, we'll, we'll look to reopen further territories. All right. Thank you, Ted, so much for doing thank this. You. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for coming. Thank you. Right there.